Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here for Crime 2 News First at 4. I'm Whitney Ward. We begin with some breaking news. We want to get right to our weather coverage as there is a severe thunderstorm moving through parts of the Palouse and potentially moving into other areas. We want to go straight to our chief meteorologist, Jeremy Lagu. Hi, Jeremy. Hey, Whitney. Uh, a couple of storms. This one a little bit farther to the south, just moving south of Lewiston, has been severe warned for quite a while. And at one point, we had radar indication that we had two and a half inch in diameter hail. That is correct. That is pretty massive. And when you're talking that type of hail, that is easily enough to do some serious damage. That storm itself is now tracking off to the north and the east. And we're looking at that thing moving pretty quick, about 40 miles per hour. And that storm is going to make its way toward Pierce or Afino. And that's going to continue to move out of the Lewiston area off to the north in Whitman County. So this is down across the Palouse. You have a storm that's moving toward Albion, Colfax, Farmington, Garfield. It's going just south of Steptoe. You might see a little bit of rain there. That storm itself has radar indicated one inch in diameter hail. That storm is warned until 4.45 p.m., so about 45 minutes on that one. That is very long for a storm to be warned. This one also moving at about 40 miles per hour. When you're talking inch in diameter hail, just bigger than a golf ball, that is big enough to dent your car, break windows, even ruin the roof of your house. So that storm moving through, we're gonna keep a close eye on that one, but if we zoom out, this is where it gets kind of interesting. We have more storms developing down to the south of it, a couple of those moving out of La Grande and into the Blue Mountains. Those storms are going to continue to track toward the southern panhandle. So those are going to go south of the Palouse. However, we do have development popping up, and that's now moving out of Pomeroy, another storm kind of gaining a little bit of momentum. And as that starts to move to the north, we'll keep an eye on that. But these storms still warned a bit longer. The one down in Nesperce warned until 4.30. And that storm is also moving at about 40 miles per hour off to the north and east. It is moving through an area with little population. However, it is moving over Highway 12. So expect that if you're planning any sort of travel. Highway 195 taking the brunt from this other storm. We will keep a very close eye on this. Does look like some of the ones are weakening down in the southern Idaho panhandle, but the one in Whitman County. We're going to keep a close eye on. Still looks very impressive. Some heavy rain and large hail out of that storm. All right, I know that you'll be very busy keeping track of that, Jeremy. Thank you very much. We have some other breaking news this afternoon. The Attorney General, the U.S. Attorney General, finally addressing the search of former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home earlier this week. Crime 2's Mark Hanrahan is joining us now here in the studio to break down what we know at this hour. Mark. Good afternoon, Whitney. The Justice Department has asked a court to unseal the search warrant the FBI received before searching the Florida estate of former President Donald Trump. That's according to the U.S. Attorney General. And CBS has confirmed before the search, Trump was issued a subpoena in the spring followed by a meeting at his estate back in June, all of it concerning documents removed from the White House. Attorney General Merrick Garland says he personally approved the decision to carry out the search warrant at the Florida home of former President Donald Trump. The department filed the motion to make public the warrant and receipt in light of the former president's public confirmation of the search, the surrounding circumstances, and the substantial public interest in this matter. His remarks followed days of criticism and outrage from Republicans and allies of the former president over the FBI search at Mar-a-Lago earlier this week. A new morning consult Politico poll shows 49% of registered voters approve of the FBI search, while 37% say they disapprove. Mr. Trump, can we have a word? Meanwhile, Mr. Trump maintained his innocence yesterday, invoking the Fifth Amendment 440 times during a four-hour deposition in New York stemming from a civil investigation into his business dealings. Is it helpful or is it hurtful in terms of legal strategy? It is usually used not in a civil case like this one being brought by the New York uh, Attorney General, but in a criminal case. And in a criminal case, generally, uh, you invoke the Fifth Amendment not to testify at all. Peter Navarro, a one-time advisor to President Trump, was in a D.C. court this afternoon following a contempt of Congress charge after he refused to cooperate with the House January 6th committee investigating the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Trump's former personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, is due in front of a Georgia grand jury next week over his alleged involvement in an alleged attempt to overturn the 2020 election.
So no word yet from former President Trump or his legal team on how they plan to respond to the Justice Department's motion to unseal the warrant. We'll certainly keep you posted, though. Whitney, back to you. All right, Mark, thank you very much for the update. And there are several wildfires that are continuing to burn across the state right now, so we want to take a look at those. There is a new wildfire now prompting level two evacuations near Cheney at this hour. Level two evacuations mean you need to be preparing to leave. Krem 2's Nathan Hyun is live from that fire line right now. Nathan. Hey, Whitney, yeah, I mean, I just got here like 30 minutes ago and there are fires on scene, additional fire crews from outside of Cheney who have come to fight this fire. I've been told that a helicopter helping out with a Luke fire first spotted this fire. And they've told me that so far Fort Progress has been stopped, but you can see just how dry the grass is around here. And just check my watch, it is 95 degrees. So they are very worried that it could jump to other places. And let's just take a quick look at the map. And right now, for those in the area shown below Western Boundary, all homes along Long Road from Rock Lake to the southern border across to Blackman Road. An eastern border runs along Texas Ferry to the northern border of Cheney Plaza. So now the fire is listed at about 25 to 30 acres. They've told me that ground crews and air crews have been working to put this fire out so far. And the fire is by Bonnie Lake with level two evacuations, but we will let you know as soon as we get more information. But for right now, live in Cheney, Nathan Hunt, Krem 2 News. All right, Nathan, thank you very much. And another fire is also still burning in Douglas County. Crews calling this one the Moore Canyon Fire, and it's already burned more than 4,600 acres. Level two evacuations are in place there as well for those living in Rimrock. Level two, again, that means you need to be preparing to leave in case conditions get worse. There are also level one evacuations in place for Wagon Road and Palisades Road all the way to the Grant County line. And there are some roads closed in the area as crews continue to work there. And dry conditions here over the next few days are keeping the fire danger extremely high. Okanagan County Commissioners declared a countywide burn ban. It starts tomorrow and will prohibit all outdoor burning of any kind, including recreational fires and fires on private land. And that ban will stay in place until October 15th, unless the county commissioners extend it or lift it. Nearly five years ago, Caleb Sharp opened fire on his classmates at Freeman High School. He killed one student and wounded three others, and that dark day changed the lives of hundreds of students, teachers, and parents. The gunman did end up pleading guilty to multiple charges, including first-degree murder and second-degree assault. Before his sentencing, the judge ordered him to hear multiple victim impact statements from those who were affected by the shooting. And today, after years of delays, sentencing for that shooter began. Krem 2's Amanda Rowley has followed this story since 2017 and was in the courtroom today for the beginning of this final chapter. She shares now what we can expect over the next few days. This morning, attorneys gave opening statements to the judge for the Freeman High School shooter sentencing. The defense says a 20 year sentence would be appropriate due to the shooter's age and lack of maturity at the time of the school shooting. However, the state is asking for a minimum of 35 years. In September 2017, 15 year old Caleb Sharp opened fire on his Freeman High School classmates. He killed one student and seriously injured three freshman girls. He pleaded guilty to multiple charges, including first degree murder and second degree assault. The shooter's defense attorney says when determining his sentence, the judge must consider mitigating factors of youth, which include his age and mental capacity. They argue that because of the shooter's youthfulness at the time of the shooting, he is deserving of a lesser punishment. You will hear that Caleb Sharp was an immature 15 year old, that he had neurocognitive disorders, and his youthfulness uh, should be the basis to find him less culpable for his criminal conduct. The defense told the judge various experts and even the shooter's family will give testimony over the next several days. And while the defense says he has the capacity for rehabilitation, the state argues against this. He still exhibits a lack of remorse and true understanding of what he did. After nearly five years of delays on this case, it is finally nearing the end. The judge is expected to make a decision on the shooter's sentence by next Friday. Reporting from the Spokane County Courthouse, Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. And today the court also heard from the doctor who evaluated Caleb Sharp on behalf of the defense. Coming up tonight on Krem 2 News at 5, we're breaking down that doctor's testimony.
Several acts of bravery saving two lives at Lake Coeur d'Alene. Bystanders jumped into action when they saw two people were drowning. Coeur d'Alene first responders say if they didn't act as quickly as they did, the situation could have ended much differently. In the midst of a very busy day at Lake Coeur d'Alene, two boys jumped off the dock near North Idaho College and started to struggle under the water. People on the beach then jumped into the lake to save them, and after getting them out, the rescuers were able to perform CPR until officials arrived. Coeur d'Alene Fire says the actions of those bystanders on the beach reflect the community as a whole. That's really indicative of our community that we're, that we're here for each other and that we want to help and protect each other and and this was just another great example of that if those boys had been underwater until we'd have gotten firefighters or the dive team there um, the the outcome probably would have been a whole lot different the two boys were taken to Kootenai Health where they have recovered. Coeur d'Alene Fire says this is the first near drowning call at Lake Coeur d'Alene this summer. Officials also say families and swimmers though need to know that Coeur d'Alene beaches are not staffed with lifeguards. So it's very important to know your limitations when entering the water and to keep an eye on those kids. All right, still to come tonight, a shortage of bus drivers forcing Spokane Public Schools now to make some very tough decisions getting ready for the upcoming school year.